Well, good morning. It's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. We still have our two services at 9 and 1030, and so glad that you could come out today at our 9 o'clock service. In a way of announcements, if you are a visitor, you fill out a visitor card, we can kind of see the crowd. We know who's visiting or not. And um, just uh, let us know how we can serve you in any way possible. Uh, remember, in a way of announcements, the blood drive is on June 17th at 1.30 to 6 at Lawson High School. That is June 17th, 1.30 to 6, a blood drive. An appointment is needed, and you can call Sharon. And if you want the number, just come see me. Uh, to go online, it's savealifenow.org slash group. And then you can sign up for the blood drive. So if you are interested in giving blood, the Lawson community is asking for uh, uh, this opportunity if we were interested in that. Also remember the summer schedule. We do have a new website, www.olduniononline.com. And so remember that, that the, the uh, messages and all the information is posted online. But you can give offering there. We will not have offering during the service during this time. There's an offering basket out here as well. So for the month of June, we'll continue the two services, 9 and 10.30. And July 5th, we'll move to one service at 10.30. July 19th, Sunday school small groups will begin. And then July 22nd, Wednesday night activities will begin as well. Remember also, um, August 2nd, uh, Children's Church and Nursery will resume worship as well. August 11th and 12th, we are taking photos for the church directory. If you remember, we were in the process of signing up, and many of you have signed up. The date has been set, August 11th and 12th, for the church directory from 2 to 9 p.m. That doesn't mean you take pictures for seven hours straight. You have to sign up and come, and we'll get um, um, your picture taken, part of the, the directory. And the sign-up sheet will be available in July as we get closer. So check your address on the information table. Pat, did you have anything you want to say about that? No, I think it was verified. Okay. So we're just making sure all addresses and everything is the same. Also, Tri-State had met. I told you last week they were going to meet. They had met, and there will be no Tri-State this year. So uh, Tri-State camp and activities for the summer has been canceled. So just give me a prayer for all the, it's like every single camp and everything's canceled. So just give me a prayer for the, the young people um, as we have a different kind of summer. Happy birthday to Sherry Bells, Bill O'Connor, Dorothy Noker, Teresa Jennings. Happy anniversary to Jeff and Kara Daler, 29 years. Gordon and Nancy Noker, 47 years. And Roger and Sandy James, 32 years. So tell them happy birthday and happy anniversary. We're going to begin today by going to the Lord in a word of prayer. And I pray, even though we may be split in two different services, let's pray that we sing out and we come to worship the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to be in your house today. In the midst of our culture and the chaos of, of so much right now, Lord, I pray that we would find rest in you. And so, Lord, as we sing today and as we declare your name on high, as we read your word, Lord, we come for this hour just to dedicate this time to you, to draw near to you, and Lord, just speak to us. Like only you can. Lord, we are grateful that you're a God who loves us. And so, Lord, we just come before your presence right now. And we pray that today would be a day that uh, um, we would just see your hand in a mighty way. And, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to guide us as individuals, as a church, as a state, as a nation. And, Lord, we turn all to you right now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you join us in singing Trust and Obey? We'll do verses 1, 2, and 5.
sing, Father, speak your word again. We'll do verses one and two. During the two-service time, we haven't had the typical prayer request where we pass the mic around, but we want to give you an opportunity to say any prayer requests that you have and or testimonies that you may have as well. So is there any prayer requests or testimonies that we can remember today? The O'Connor family. Yes, the Connor family. Do you remember them, the loss of a baby? Pray for all that, yes. All the families affected. Yes, Pat. Yes, Pat. The O'Connors, remember them, and Debbie Curitan, and Shirley Noker's having surgery too. Is that correct? This week, yeah. Remember Shirley Noker this week? She's having surgery. Yeah. Don't want to forget uh, Randy Yes, Randy Zekel passed away. I'll mention that in my message. Um, I will save my comments to that in my sermon because I have something to say about that. But do Randy Zekel had a heart attack and passed away Friday, and uh, just be in prayer for the family. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand that this is a big institution and that they're out there putting up all of us, but our whole country has an attitude. So we need to lift up the leaders. Yeah. Oh. Who we really are. <laughs> pray for the church to be the church. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So we take time to pray for our church, the churches in general, the church as a whole, our country. I would agree with all that. And again, I'll save a lot of my comments for my message, so, but with some of this, but um, but do keep in keep him in prayer. Okay. Pray for all military as well. Yes, Terry. Any others? Robeson family who lost a loved one, a small child. Paul Watkins, uh, was battling with leukemia. Who who'd you say? Paul Watkins is the guy that's okay. on the road. Yeah. Battling with leukemia. Okay. 
Paul Walken's mother fail, fell, fail, <laughs> fell, and then is, is uh, struggling. Any others? Any testimonies of what God's doing through all this? Yeah, watching over us, guiding us, and directing us. Yes. So Steve, remember Steve. All the appointments. Yes. My brother with uh not feeling good about body and physically got the virus that we had talked to and he had had it done to him or him to his dad and it's been been a long time since he's been able to do that. Okay. What was his name again? Jim. Jim. Okay, thank you. Remember Jim and our prayers and sickness. Any others? Hurricane, yeah. They said we've already had three, three storms, and that's more than we've ever had this early. So pray for that as well. A lot of stuff going on. Yeah, no, it does. Maybe Jesus is returning soon. Who knows? <laughs> if it happened today, I'd be excited. Yeah. <laughs> Any others? If not, let's go to the Lord with a prayer remembering these requests. Lord, we are grateful that you're a God who hears all these requests. We have many today that were mentioned. And Lord, I pray that as we look at those requests, whether it be a family member that is facing appointments or um, friends that are dealing with things that have happened around them, Lord, or families that lost loved ones. Lord, we just pray right now, Lord, that you would just take those situations and, Lord, give them strength. I pray for those that are sick, Lord, that you would just heal them and just uh, restore them. Lord, I pray for in their life that your will be done, that they would navigate that with the proper perspective, and, Lord, we just lift it to you. We do pray for all the military and the police and our country as a whole, and it just seems like so much with the storms and everything. Lord, we know that you are God who, again, is in control. And so, Lord, we just pray that as we navigate through all of this, Lord, that we keep our eyes upon you. Lord, I pray that uh, as we look at your word and as we look at our lives and look at the culture, I pray that we would line up our lives with your word to impact the culture. And so, Lord, we just give you today. We pray that uh, you would just use this day to further your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship. No higher calling.
37, and we'll toss, also look at Psalm 33, and then we will skip around at the end. So we will skip around. The verses all will be on the screen as well. Lauren's bringing something that I'm going to illustrate today by using a ladder. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, I guess set it over here. Can everybody see the screen okay, if I have it right there? Good. <laughs> Do you know about ladders in our church? I don't. Lots of people have fell off and broke them. Yeah, we'll pray that this does not happen then. <laughs> we'll see how far I get before I fall off. <laughs> My son Jacob was in kindergarten, he's my 23 year old, and uh, he was in kindergarten and we were invited to go to a party. If you're invited to a party, you're excited to go and you uh, want to go. He was excited because his best friend's party. Now, as the dad of the kindergartner, this was, he was five, so it was 18 years ago, 19 years ago, I don't know, um, I'm like, I have to take a, I think it was a Sunday afternoon actually. I had to take a Sunday afternoon to go take him to a party I didn't want to be at in Blue Springs area to some little uh, tunnel town area kind of deal. Um, it was in Blue Springs. So here I am getting out in the party, not really wanting to be there, and all of a sudden, tornado sirens go off. And I'm thinking, is it really real? And I look outside, and the clouds are really dark. And sure enough, they come over the intercom, we're going to our safe place, please. You know, they had this room that they wanted to say, oh, get in there, because there was a tornado spotted in the area. Now, I, my first thought is, my family, my wife, you know, I had, we had two kids at the time, Bethany is all we had, right? Do we have Noah too? We had Noah, okay, I couldn't remember, see? We did. Okay. I don't even remember. All I remember is my kids and my family was at home. So my time runs so weird. <clears throat> and I was thinking, okay, do I sit here? What about them? You know, trying to get a hold of them. Because I'm more concerned about my family than I am here at being stuck at Tunnel Town in Blue Springs. And so I thought to myself when I waited, I hear the sirens. I don't see a tornado. I'm just going to drive. And so they said, sir, it probably isn't safe to go. And I'm like, well, is it any safe to stay? I mean, I, so I was thinking, I want to make sure. I'm, so I'm driving home from Blue Springs, trying to get to where I need to go. And I'm trying to go. And traffic is terrible. I think everybody's trying to get where they need to go. And the clouds looked really bad. Did I see a tornado that day? No. But that tornado is the one that hit Liberty. It was that same day that, you know, if it hit William Jewell campus and all over. That was the same day. And I was out driving in the middle of it. I didn't see the tornado. I don't have any tornado stories. I wasn't chasing the tornado. But I was definitely saw the effects of what the party was. And I, had, I wanted to leave this party and go to another one, even if it meant risking. Now, we are invited to a party. And today, because we've been talking about renovating our minds, I want you to join this party. And it's going to be kind of risky, like me driving in that tornado. Now you would say, okay, this party that we're invited to, I want us to understand that this party is risky. This party is different. What you're going to hear today may be different than what you're hearing on social media right now and all this stuff. But I do believe this is what God had me to speak on based on my heart and his word. And... Uh, and this party is important. Now, you love parties, right? You want to be invited to a party. In fact, did you know that there's 800,000 birthdays a day? 800,000. So happy birthday online to 800,000 people who are celebrating their birthday today. 800,000 birthdays a day. On the average, a person at the party who has a birthday gets eight birthday cards and four gifts. And I thought it was interesting to note that approximately in this past year, 110,000 people celebrated their 100th birthday. 
110,000 people celebrated their 100th birthday. That many? They said in the next 10 years, it could be up to 200,000 people celebrating their 100th birthday. Now, that's a party to go to. August has the most birthdays, which I thought was kind of weird. And we love to celebrate, so maybe August is the time we should celebrate the most. How do you feel, though, when you're not invited to the party? We live in a society right now where craziness is going on. There's unrest. And I want us to join this party. And the neat thing is, as you're here today, this party, we've been invited. To kind of review where we're going, we've read this verse. It says, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In other words, we need to be transformed. And we talked about how being transformed and how we view God, how we view people. Last week, how we view our possessions. And today, how we view purpose. Do you realize that you have a purpose or do you not? Today, if we get this, if we understand this and we get this, then guess what? Our view of purpose can change our life. True of all of us, we have some sort of opinion about purpose. Some people believe there's no purpose. We just live and die. Some people believe there is a purpose. We can't just, we can't find it. We're searching, but we don't know if we can ever find it. And some people are smack dab saying, yes, I'm in the middle of my purpose. And all that we think about purpose can impact how we see the world and how we see the situation which we're in. Here's the problem, though, and I've had this. Some people think, and great people that I love think this. You may think this, and we will disagree. Because I have very good people, in fact, family members that disagree with me. And so we can debate. If, if you want to debate me, just take this week when we prep and we can get points to debate me in this. Some people believe the sense of purpose is God will just bless. There's no exact plan for your life. That you just obey and you don't have to worry. You'll be in the middle of God's plan as long as you obey. Well, I was fortunate enough, I say fortunate enough, to have a pastor who said, Danny, God has a plan for your life. And he has a calling on your heart. And that's one reason why I'm a pastor today, because when I was a teenager, he discipled me one-on-one because we had, how many teenagers in my Sunday school class? Me. And he sat there, and he, he conversed with me, and he told me, Danny, you don't want to miss God's plan for your life. And I heard that quite frequently. And he says, you don't want to mess up. You don't want to miss it, because a lot of people just kind of live, and they miss it. Because I went to college and I sat there and my college vice president, who I was in the ministry group, had a scholarship to preach. And I sat in college and the vice president of college was our, my mentor. And he said, you can do whatever. God will bless it as long as you obey God. There's no plan. And I believe that God brought me Amy, just the way we set up together, how that happened. Who else, how else would anybody marry me other than God working on her heart? That's what I thought too. And I thought, God brought her in my life, perfect person for me. And I kind of pushed back to the vice president of the college, and I said, I do believe that God brought the person I'm supposed to be with. And I do believe God's called me to be a pastor. He can call you to be a lot of things. He'll just bless it. And I was, like, confused because I heard something different. But I'm so grateful for my pastor who grounded me in believing this. Now, you may disagree with me. You may say, well, God just will bless whatever, as long as we're obedient. But as my pastor said, I don't want to miss it. Why do I believe this? This passage really points it to me. Psalm 37, 23. I can't get this out of my mind. If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. In other words, as it says here, the steps of a righteous man are ordered, as it says, by the Lord. Are ordered by the Lord. So today, some well good many people may say, God doesn't have a specific plan for you. I believe that he does. That could be a problem you're wrestling with right now. I think it's like the difference between having MapQuest and Google on your phone. MapQuest tells you to go north, south, and I can't always figure out north and south. The, The Google on my phone tells me exactly where to go, and I believe that God orders our steps and makes our steps firm, and he orders it to where we should go. The second thing that the problem is, 
is we feel empty and searching. And you say, well, Danny, if God has a plan for my life, why do I feel empty? I can't find it. I don't even know what it is. I guarantee you today that if you leave here and you get this message, not because of me, but because of hearing God's word, I do believe that you can know what God's plan is for your life and then take the next step to obey it. I do believe that. Why? Why do you believe this passage? You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. It comes from seeking the Lord. We have a lot of people that are searching. They do feel empty. Many years back, 10, 15 years ago, Purpose Driven Life was a book. It was 90 weeks a bestseller. And people who bought it weren't just people who were down and out. It was people who were successful in the world's eyes. And they go to bed at night and they think, if you ever had this moment, is this it? I'm middle-aged now. Let's announce that, by the way. I'm 45. I'm middle-aged, right? I'm not young anymore. I'm kind of in one of those weird positions, I feel like. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you all can help me. I'm 45, so I can't relate with the younger people because I'm not young anymore. And then if I say I'm old, everybody looks at me like, well, you're not old. So I don't fit anywhere. I'm kind of this in the middle. And it's like... I can't relate with young, and, and I'm not really old, or at least people tell me I'm not old. I feel old. But then you get to the point where you think, is this it? You start asking questions at my age, is this all this life is? Is it going to be another 45 years of the same thing? Have you ever asked that? Is this it? I'm still searching, trying to figure out what is God's plan for my life. I'm 45 and still trying to figure it out. Or I'm 55 or 65 still trying to figure it out. I'm not quite sure. I don't want to miss it. You say, Danny, you don't want to miss it. But somewhere along the way, we go to bed at night, we look up at the ceiling, and we say, just don't know. And I do believe that's why Purpose Driven Life was 90 weeks on a bestseller, because we have a lot of people that are searching. God says he has a plan, and you can know it. And until you know it, and see it, and live it, you may be saying the same question, is that all? And then there's the third group of people, which is not on the screen. It's the people that maybe are living right in the middle of their purpose. I pray that we get there. Hopefully today, through this message, you can see how to find God's plan and purpose for your life. I brought the ladder because I want to do steps all the way to the top. And I think it's a stair-step process of finding God's purpose for your life. And I think it starts with Psalm 33, 8 and 9. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people for the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and stood firm. I don't know about you, but since March, our world's been turned upside down, hasn't it? COVID, unrest. And you read this verse and you say, let all the earth fear the Lord, all the people of the world revere him, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and stood firm. And you read that and it smack dab a whole bunch of purpose in this two, these two verses. And you would look at me and say, with the virus and with the unrest that we have, what kind of purpose is God up to? This is a crazy world. Is God in control? And if God has a sense of purpose, does he have a sense of purpose for me? Now, the man who wrote this was David, through the inspiration of God, the most powerful guy in the world. He makes a statement. Now, most of Psalms, if you were to read Psalms, has a statement and then a description of what it really means, kind of like Proverbs a little bit. And it says, it says here that the earth fears the Lord. Why? The answer to the question. For he spoke and it came to be. And it came to be. As he says, the first point here we get, if we're going to find a sense of purpose in the midst of chaos, in the midst of our lives, what do we have to do? We have to know that God is up to something in our world. It says, that in the world it stood firm, regardless of where you are today, do you believe God is up to something. And it starts, as it says, fearing the Lord, as it says in verse 8 of Psalm 33, as we read, let all the earth fear the Lord. Everyone should just pause 
and fear the Lord. The first step. I'm going to climb the first step. I'll be at the top before this is over. So, Gordon, if I fall, you got to catch me, all right? Because you brought the ladder. So the first step is fearing the Lord. That's the first step to get to the purpose. So if we're going to survive this chaotic unrest and all the stuff that's going on and find purpose in it, what I do believe what we need to do, as David said, is we need to stop and fear the Lord, as it says in this passage. Oops. All right, my battery just went out of my thing, so you have to do it. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people for the world revere him. In other words, we need to fear God and revere him. If we're going to find purpose, it starts by giving our life to Christ and re giving respect to God. And today, if you're going to find purpose in your life, it starts by giving respect to God. And it's in a world that stood firm, it says here, regardless of where you're at, he says, the, all the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere him, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. God speaks and the world begins. He was up to something. And we pause and we ask the question, if there's a God who created all of this, and I respect him and he's up to something, the real question is why? Why? Was God bored? Why did he do what he did? Was he doing an experiment? What in the world? Why would he do such a thing? And we're face to face with why am I here? A purpose somehow connected to the divine. Today, let me ask you a question. Do you fear the Lord? I didn't mean fear like scared fear, but respect. And I think if we're going to find purpose, it's going to be respecting the Lord. And what it is is knowing that I'm not God... And he is. That sounds so simple. But I think we have a culture that thinks, I am God, he is not. And then they wonder why they can't find purpose in the chaos. We have to first acknowledge God as who he is and who he says he is. That he is all-powerful, almighty, heavenly father, in control, sovereign. If we can't get that first step, then you will look around at the news and everything and find no purpose. But if we get respect to God and awe of like how broken I am, and let's be honest, we are broken. If we don't believe that, then we're in trouble. We're broken and we need God, all of us. And we start with that respect. Can you do that today? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you've never been broken before the Lord, I pray today would be the day of salvation. That you would see me afterwards, the most important thing you could do to find purpose is give your life to Jesus Christ. That you would ask him to be Lord and Savior of your life. And if you're here today and you are a Christian and you've given your life to the Lord, would you give him the glory that is due him, even in the midst of chaos? And that's how we start finding purpose. Well, the next one is step two. Our plans are temporary. Look at verse 10. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the people. We read verses 8, 9, and 10. It says here, he foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the people. In other words, as I said, it showed you in verse, on the second point, God's plans are, or man's plans are temporary. The second step, once we revere God and understand who he is, we climb to the second step and we realize, <laughs> my plans are temporary. In other words, I can plan out my whole day. You ever had this where you had a whole day planned out and it didn't quite go as you thought? Maybe you had a day like that. Maybe it's been a week like that. How about a month? How about a decade? How about a lifetime? I don't know about you. I'm not saying my life's bad. But I could not have predicted at 10 years old, where I'd be today. In fact, when I got on bus 8, we drove around. I lived like five minutes from here. Did you all know you all knew that? I never dreamed at 45 I'd be pastoring this church. I didn't like, oh, someday I'm going to pastor Old Union Church. You see, God had different plans, and he does the same for all of us. Our plans are temporary. As long as we're okay with that, understand that. We can make, it doesn't mean that we go willy-nilly not make plans. But as it said here in verse 10, Back to verse 10. So 
God foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of his peoples. Everybody can plan, but we need to understand that it can be canceled by God. In other words, if the government has a plan, God trumps it, overrides it. If people have a plan, God overrides it, he trumps it. If your personal life has a plan, God trumps it, overrides it. And we think life will work out and life happens, but God can foil any man's plans. As powerful as we are, as much money as we think we have, David knew that God's plans trump anything else. And his plans are the best. Do you believe that God can stop any plan and move in direction? This past week, we were watching a show on Netflix that was, given, that was told to me. Noah mentioned it, and my daughter mentioned it, called the American Gospel. And on this, there was this one guy and wife who were atheists, and she actually was successful, and she got sick. She was, a, she was into fitness and all this kind of stuff. She had plans of th- what things were going to be, and she got real sick and got diagnosed with this big, long disease. And then she just battled and battled and battled. She had to have children or, or she, she didn't be worse. So she had two kids, and then they stopped having kids. Um, but one day she was really sick, and she went to the doctor or the hospital emergency room. And the emergency room said, everything's okay. And she says, well, I just don't feel right. And so they were getting ready to take her home. And one of the nurses says, I want to check you again because I feel God leading me to check you. Something's not right. Even though all the tests turned out okay, something's not right. She says, I feel the presence of God. That's what she said to her. And this lady's an atheist or agnostic or just not really caring about God. And she went and she said, okay. They found that she was bleeding internally. If he would have left the hospital, she would have died. And it was that day, she says, that the kind of the transformation of God working in her heart because her whole life she had a plan to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And then she now was faced with the sickness. She ended up getting like three or four sicknesses. I mean, she listed all of it. And then she says, but I'm happier now than I was when I was successful in business and fit and exercise. I'm happier now because God is in my life. Her plans had changed. God was searching and moving. Today, do you realize that we can't get frustrated when plans change, when things happen? We just trust God in the midst of it. How about the third step? God's plan is firm forever. There's no stopping it. This is the third step. So God's plan is firm. I'm going to fall off, aren't I? God's plan is firm. In other words, this ladder is firm, right? As it says in verse 11, he says this. Next slide, sir. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. In other words, what David is saying, God has plans and his plans stand firm. No one can stop. His purpose is for all generations. What David understood in all of history, that God has a multi-generational plan that no person can stop No country can stop, no leader can stop, no business, no media, no unrest. And David realized something real quick, that David was part of God's plan, not God part of David's plan. There's a huge difference between what I just said. Because sometimes in the Christian realm, we ask, Lord, what is God's plan for my life and what we're really wanting is we're wanting God to be in the middle of our plan. But what if, like David, we ask, Lord, what is your plan? What are you up to? And help me to see how I play a part in your plan. That's what we want to see. How do I play a part in your plan? Because your plans stand firm forever. We get away from being me-centered. And we're part of God's plan. Purpose of God. That God is up to something. Something. When I was in college, I had a professor, had a lot of professors, and one of them was a, a Bible class, and he frustrated me a little bit. I'm not real big into people who have to have everything, especially professors. I have trouble with, with that, I'm, maybe because I'm not, you know, they have to have everything just ducks in a row constantly, but it makes me work hard, I guess, so that's good. 
And I remember him giving this question. We had to write this paper, and I studied and researched, had like seven or eight pages typed up. It took me weeks, a couple weeks to do it, and I had it all up, and I was proud of my paper. Turned it in, thinking, this is going to be a good grade. Finally, for once in a lifetime, I'm going to get a good grade. And I get it back, F. And I'm thinking, what? I spent two weeks and get an F. And at the bottom he says, great paper, you answered the wrong question. Fortunately, he knew the paper was good enough that it probably been a good grade if it was the right question. So he let me redo it. But then I realized, oh yeah, I did. I answered the wrong question. I spent eight pages of research answering the wrong question. Because I just saw how I saw it. And I think so much of us, and I remember I'm going with this. In the midst of the chaos, we sometimes look at the wrong perspective. I don't want to be political here, but I think there's a bigger problem, which I think that problem was around before all of the unrest and before everything else, the bigger problem, and it's a three-letter word called sin. Sin. And God has plans to tackle that sin. And he's had plans to tackle that sin. And he continues to have plans to tackle that sin. People need Christ. Multi-generational plan stands firm. Now it gets to the fourth point. Now that you know that God has a plan, his plans are secure... And that our plans are temporary and we need to honor God. You're invited to join God. God's not joining you. That's the fourth one. I'm not going to fall, am I? Nervous now, are we? I've done this before, by the way. So There we go. The fourth one. And you may get to the top. I'll really get everybody's attention. It's more of an attention grabber here. The fourth one is simply this, that we realize that we're invited to join God. God is not joining us. All invited to be a part of this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And he died that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Then verse 19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. God's in the business of reconciling the world himself to Christ. He goes on to say, which is not on the screen, that he's entrusted us to play a part of that reconciliation. We've all been invited, as he says, he entrusted us to fit into this multi-generational plan of God. You see, Abraham was picked for a plan to send the Messiah if through his family, God was going to send the Messiah. Abraham's family was part of the plan. Moses, part of the plan. He was picked to lead the nation of Israel and become a kingdom. Then David to establish that reign. And then Solomon with the temple. And then Jesus was the epicenter of what God is up to. Forty different people wrote a story. It was a story of truth inspired by the Holy Spirit to show God's handiwork from creation through on. And Jesus gives us to play a part. He gave us the what? The great commission. And he told them to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's been passed down and down and down and now we've been invited to be part of that plan. To reconcile people. In other words, we've been entrusted to reconcile people from sin to God. God's the one that does the saving. God uses us. He doesn't have to use us, but he chooses to use us. To be invited to be part of his plan. In fact, old union is here because people in the past, in the 1800s, correct? Think about that. 
How can a living organism live without God from the 1800s to now in this area? Is there a business that is still around from the 1800s to now in this area? Maybe, I don't know. We have to almost think about it. You realize this is a successful organization if we were looking at it from the world's eyes for a moment. We've been around since the 1800s because people who love the Lord passed it around to where we are today. And guess what? We're part of this passing this baton to the next generation. A hundred years from now, they can say, our picture could be on the wall. They can look at our church directory that we're going to take and say, wow, I'm so glad these people remain faithful. It's a multi-generational thing, seeking God to be a part of his plan. Would we trust him in that? Before I go into the last couple steps, I know I'm short on time. You may be saying, well, Danny, this is hard because when I go home, it's as cold as ice. There's no, God's not at work. If there's a plan, I don't see it. It just seems like there's nothing. Maybe your spouse isn't responding or your kids aren't responding or your job's not responding. And it just seems like, well, Danny, this is all nice. It all sounds good. This is what I hear. But you're a preacher. This isn't the real world. If you lived in the real world and not just the church world, then you'd understand that I see nothing happening right now at my job, nothing at work. God is absent, it seems like, all this stuff. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus was on the earth, what was the people's focus? Rome. In other words, if you're asked what the big story was, is they were being trapped by Rome. And Jesus made a profound statement. And he told the disciples, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. And forceful men lay hold of it. In other words, he was telling the disciples, we're in an exciting time. God's at work. And the disciples look at each other like, I don't see anything happening. And Jesus is like, wait a minute. This is, we're, we're, this is at the epicenter. This is the, the thing that is happening. That is the number one thing. And until now, could it be that the kingdom of God is advancing? Could it be that you didn't really, you and I may not are able to see God advancing, but he really is? In the midst of the chaos? How do we find it? James 1, 5, and 6. Never mind. It's not up there. Ask wisdom from God and he'll provide it. So we ask him, Lord, help me to see your plan, what you're up to, of reconciliation. We can spend our whole life and miss it. Then we get to the fifth step. And because of the sake of time, I won't climb the ladder. I won't climb all the way. Everybody's saying, thank you, Danny. When we get to the top of this ladder, there's actually a sixth point. You may miss God's purpose. Luke 18, 18 through 24, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? And so we see this passage and we think Jesus here is telling this, this rich young ruler who says this, that, that um, okay, I've done everything, I've been moral, I've kept the commandments. And what he's basically saying here is this, um, you need to sell everything. And he goes, well, I can't do that. Did God have bigger plans for him? Next slide, please. That's the James 1, 5, and 6. It talks about asking wisdom. He gives generously. If the rich young ruler was standing before, the, was standing before us now, what do you think he would say to us? I wish I would have sold everything. You don't want to miss it. What God is up to. And the people at the time of Jesus, they could rub shoulders with him. They may not have saw that the Son of God was going to save them of their sins. You see, I think that so often we people who are Christians, we spend so much time 
looking at our money, our jobs, our family, the riots, the COVID, all this kind of stuff. And we may miss the kingdom of God at work. It's happening all around us. And he's inviting us to be a part of it. And we actually are in exciting times. As one pastor, once I think it was Spurgeon that said this, whenever there's chaos in a country or stuff like this, is ample opportunity for people to hear the gospel. Don't let this time waste to share the gospel and hope that's within us. With all that in mind, that God is up to something, our plans are temporary, he's wanting reconciliation to forgive sin, and we need to be about his business and not just miss it. That leads us to the last step. Everyone and every day are important matter to God. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. In John 3, 16, this verse has been quoted throughout all of, if you've been in church, you know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only one son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And what he's saying here is this, that he sent his son to die for us. Every day matters. Every person matters. And we've been invited to be a part, not to be comfortable Christians, but to take risks and share the hope that's within us. There was a mother that was having a gathering to celebrate the birth of her newborn son, and she invited a bunch of her friends over to celebrate his arrival. She welcomed the guests. They all had a great time celebrating and eating. And after a while, one of the ladies says, well, bring the baby out. Let's see it. The mother went to get the baby from the crib. He was nowhere to be found. She started to panic, and she was fearful, and suddenly she remembered that the baby was still at her parents' house. She left the baby at grandparents' house. She and the guests had been having so much fun, they forgot about the real reason for the celebration. We can spend so much time focusing all, all around us and forget the real reason what God is up to, drawing people to him. And going to church can be like going to the party and not really being part of the reconciliation if we're not about being part of what God is up to. So how do you fit in all this? What part is God going to use you to help reconcile people to God? And you would say, well, Danny, I'm not gifted in evangelism. You don't have to be gifted in evangelism. And I'm going to show you how. I'm going to tell you the final illustration. But I will say this. My pastor always said this when he met with me one-on-one. -on -one. I'm so grateful for him. It can bring me to tears. He said, Danny, there's no better place than being in the middle of God's will, whatever that is. No better place. You don't want to miss it. And so I was very intentional when I surrendered to the ministry because I was like, I don't know what it is, but I know that God has a plan, and he set that up for me, what God is up to. Up to how, And really, it's God wants to reconcile people to him. Lord, use me however you see fit. In other words, today, God's plan is for you to be a part of what he's doing, and then you need to say, Lord, use me however you see fit. And then you obey to today, and then you obey tomorrow, what you what he's asking you to do, even if it's uncomfortable. One last verse, and then the story, Second Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen the hearts who are fully committed to him. God is looking and searching for hearts that are fully his, being about his purposes. And this is where I'm going to take, and I know we don't have a whole lot of 20-year-olds in here, but I would speak to the teenagers and 20-year-olds. My kids are the, the two right here, but if we see online, we have some. Um, if you're in college or single and young, don't, I don't want you to spend the rest of your life chasing after something. And then when you get it in your 40s or 50s, you end up asking the question, is this it? I want you to get God's plan in your 20s because we can spend a whole lot of decades wasting it. That God is looking for someone to use. Don't be like the dog chasing his tail. As we chase after full bank accounts, we chase after retirement for what? We chase after living a good life. We call so-called good life for what? But God is up to something in the world, and we need to be a part of it. On July 19th, we're going to start small groups, and the small group that I've been a part of on Sunday mornings, I'd like to, I know that you probably already went through this Bible study, but I want to revisit it. I've been through it a couple times but it's so good about explaining this, that God is inviting you to be to join him where he's at work, not you joining God. And we know this is experiencing God. So on July 19th, I'm going to roll that out. But God's invited us to be a part of what he's at work. 
I don't want to have an empty life full of stuff. I don't want to have a full church that's empty. I see a lot of full churches with a lot of people, but they're void of doing God's business is what I mean. I'd rather have a small church doing God's business than a big church empty and void of God. I don't want to have a full bank account and a meaningless empty job. I don't want to have full family with kids and grandkids and emptiness in my home. I want to be in the middle of the activity of God in my family, in my church, in Lawson, in Missouri, in the United States. Lord, use me however you see fit in this craziness, unrest, chaotic world. I, I, I seek you. And as it says in, in Proverbs 19.21, that God's plans will prevail. I don't think I had that on the screen. It just came ahead. But man has plans, but God's plans prevail. I know we're at 10 o'clock, but one last story that impacted me to show how you can be part of God's plan and not even know it. Randy Zekel passed away. You all know him, right? He impacted my life more than he realized and more than probably, you know, almost, you know, when people pass away, you wouldn't get all sentimental, but I really was, I, what was really, I'm going to cry. He was supposed to be here today. He had called me and Jimmy Joe, who I went to high school with, had said that, um, or Jimmy Joe had told me that Randy and him were coming. He'd been visiting church when I was at Holt and then here. And he actually, uh, someone that made an impact in my life, and I've used him in illustrations. And I know he's with the Heavenly Father now without any reservation. The reason why he made an impact on my life is because I was 15 and he went to my church. He showed up one day and I knew him before, and he tells me his before story. You all know his before story and after. And I'm going to speak to him right now because I knew him before. He's a fun guy, if you know what I mean. And I remember him showing up. We had a Bible school, and his daughter showed up, and he was the one I told you about where I saw a transformation in someone. I don't like using names, but I'm going to use his name now to honor him. Yeah, I, was going to, I had him in my notes to honor him in this presence to say, Randy, I'm going to use a story about how God changed your life because he talks about it. And he's not here. And with a funny, ironic thing, his name was typed in my notes to share that this week, him being here, and he's not here. But he's with the Lord, and God has different plans. I remember not very many sermons preached from my pastor. I remember a lot of the Bible study. I remember some. But I do remember one sermon that stood out that was preached by Randy Zeigel. Did you know he preached a sermon? A few months after he was saved, it was Layman Sunday, and they were looking for just people in the church that were going to share a message. And he signed up to preach a sermon. Randy Zeigel did at my church. And he stood up there, and it was about 10 minutes long, 15 minutes long, I don't know. But I remember him saying, I can't carry a tune. In, I remember him saying this. I can't carry a tune in the bucket, but I want to sing the loudest I possibly can because God's changed my life. You remember him saying that. And as a 15-year-old sitting there listening to him, that's when I really got it that God can change someone's life. Because I saw his life before and I saw his life after. And it was transformational for a 15-year-old. He literally became my Sunday school teacher. Did you all know that? Right before I started in the ministry, he's my Sunday school teacher. So we talked a lot. And he just spoke to me. I saw a guy who had completely was in love with Jesus. And his prayers, I've, I sat in college and I listened to what I call educational. <laughs> I was going to college at the time. Educational prayers, you know, the, the big theology and all this kind of stuff. And Randy would pray in church because we had a small church, Beacon Baptist. And his prayers, honestly, being a new Christian was simple. He wasn't afraid to pray out loud. But he had no idea. I was watching him. And it's impacted my ministry from here because God can change lives. 
And he's about changing lives and reconciling people to him. And he did that for Randy Zekel. It inspired me in my ministry to continue on. And I've seen God continue to change lives like he did Randy's. Randy just celebrated, and I was going to say this too, 30 years of sobriety just here recently. So I'm 45. I was 15 when he gave his life to the Lord. That's 30 years. And I was going to just congratulate him today. And he's not with us. So on this Friday, I was shocked when I had in my notes. I thought, I'm going to share his story anyway. Because God's about reconciling people. So I end with this, and I know I'm over 10 o'clock. We look at all the unrest, all the stuff, all the things, and we pray for our nation. And I do believe we should pray, and we should literally be on our knees. But I do believe this with all sincerity. God is up to something. And we have a choice as Christians. We can either be a part of being what God's up to or being fearful of what's happening around us. And I choose to be a part of what God's up to. And I pray that all of us would say, you know what? God's in the business of reconciling. He gives me a sense of purpose, reconciling people to you. And God can change lives. It could be my family members. It could be my work, whatever it could be. Don't miss God's purpose. Honor him today. Know your plans are temporary. God's plans stand firm. He's inviting you to be a part of it. And when you finally get it, then you're a part of reconciling people to Christ. He's using you. And, light, and, and then everybody is important. And things change. Would you, would you join us as Christians in doing that thing this week? Of just And really the rest of our lives. Of seeking God and his plans in the midst of chaos. Just at the time of Jesus, no one knew that Jesus at that time, no one knew. A lot of people didn't understand that Jesus was up to something big because they were focused on everything else. Help us not get so focused on everything else that we miss that God is up to something big. Let's pray. Lord, I pray today that you would just be with us. pray that your hand be upon this time. I pray that in our country, Lord, as we sing this final song and as we go before your presence, Lord, I pray that you would just help us today not to miss what you're up to. I pray that you would just speak to us, Lord, like never before. And, Lord, that we would realize that your purposes um, prevail. And so, Lord, we are grateful that you're a God who loves us and who's called us. And I pray that we would take the steps necessary to be right in the middle of your activity today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing this final song?
Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for everything you've given to us. And even as I share the story of Randy, he did not know that he was in the business of, of in the middle of your plan, but he was just by being obedient, by speaking and, and just investing in my life and making a difference in me. And Lord, Lord sometimes that our obedience is, is uh, sometimes we seek your plan, but Lord, we pray that we obey one day at a time. And you continue to reveal your plan to us and some of your purposes. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be about your business, being obedient and seeking you. And you order our steps. And you do have that specific plan. But it takes us just taking that first step. And, Lord, I pray that as we sing this song that we would continue to fully surrender to you completely and totally. Lord, be with our country. Be with the things that we face. Lord, we turn it all to you right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.